Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to listen to me. I really appreciate it. I know you didn't have to come, and I'm glad you did, because hopefully we get to have some fun today. Um, I work at a company called Day One. Actually, the company's called Bloombuilt, but uh, we make a journaling app called Day One, and I've got stickers. So if you want stickers, if you're a sticker person, come and see me afterward. I've also got stickers for Egghead and other things, too. Um, and my handle on Twitter is Sploding Socks, so you're free to follow me. And this is important, too. My wife gave me some input about personal branding. <laughs> and I got some special Sploding Socks just for the conference, so uh, living up to my name. Today, I want to talk to you about how Elm can fit in with other technologies, because it's fantastic all by itself as a front-end web app development platform, but it's also very good when it's mixed in with other technologies, too, to solve a greater problem. So we're going to do some server stuff. We're going to do some client stuff. We're going to do some interop between JavaScript. Elm's better when it's, it's got its friends. Um, but in order to do this, we're going to have to take kind of a big picture approach. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time mucking around with the details of the code necessarily. I want to instead kind of highlight the parts from 1,000 feet that fit together and how they work. And it's OK to get excited. If you get excited and you just have to scream because you're so excited, I'm not going to be bothered. That's fine. OK, great. Um, also, I spent a while drawing this really nifty little map. So hope you enjoy that, too. Um, somebody make a tweet about that, because I want fame. OK, so here's a scenario. In order to present how a whole product goes together, I want to give us a little contrived story. And, uh, what we're going to do is pretend that we are a small consultancy. And I know we're not small. This is a large number of people, much larger than I expected. But pretend, nonetheless, that we're a small consultancy. And a friend of ours has just approached us with a new project. And she says, all right, here's what I got. I got funder dollars. And here, I've been thinking through. I've got this great idea. I want to fit music into 140 characters. And we're like, what? Why? What? Why? And she's like, OK, here's the image. Everyone in the world is tweeting constantly. We could turn that into a constant concert of musical magnificence. And we're pretty impressed by her word choice. But we're like, OK, well, tell us how this works. She's like, I've come up with a new musical notation to pack a bunch of music into 140 characters. And I would re really like you to, uh, to help me make this happen in the browser. And so uh, she shows us the musical notation. And this is important, so pay attention. And I'm going to try to use my mouse to highlight things, but I may fail at that. We'll see here. It we'll starts with a letter, A through G, that will optionally, I'm sorry, not optionally, a letter A through G to dictate what note will be played. That is optionally followed by a plus or a minus to indicate whether the note is going to be sharp or flat, or natural if you omit it. Or instead of a letter, you could use the dash character to indicate that it's a rest in the music. Now, the next two things are optional also. You can have a letter T, S, E, Q, H, or W, which indicate the length of the note. That's just the first letter of the kind of note it is, 32nd, 16th, 8th quarter, half hole. And then lastly, a number, 0 through 8, indicating the octave in which the note's going to be played. So that's the notation. And all you really need is that first letter, A through G. Uh, and anything that is not those special characters will be omitted. So here's an example of a B-flat 16th note in the second octave. Broken up, B minus is the flat, S is 16th, and 2 is the second octave. Now, you can stick anything else you want in between those characters. A bunch of stuff can be in there. We're just going to ignore it. We're just going to look for this pattern specifically. Now, I have a two-year-old daughter, and her favorite song at the time of writing this talk was Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. So that's what occurred to me. So here's a twinkle, twinkle, little star in this notation looks like. Uh, it's like C, C, G, G, A, A. Nobody knows this song. I'm sorry. <laughs> I picked the wrong song. OK. Well, pretend you know it. And then here is the, the pack down version. So uh, you can fit quite a, quite a few notes into a few characters. Um, those are just the bare essentials. All right. Also, she's given us some designs. She, she paid like $10 million for some designer to go mock up the thing. And 
because uh, she had the money, because investors, everything's fine. So here's the mock-up. Here's what it should look like. Don't clap, don't clap. Those, those were just the designs. We've done nothing yet. Remember? OK, <laughs> yeah. So don't clap. Um, but that is what we're going to end up with. It looks a little bit difficult, because it's like, well, we've got to like, highlight notes and make them play and stuff. How are we going to do it? Well, you are about to learn how we're going to do it. Getting it done. OK. We're going to cut this into four parts. Hope my time is going well, too. I'm going to cut this into four parts. The part one is this first row here. Uh, there's my mouse. Maybe I should just point, because I can't even see my mouse. First row, if that makes sense. It's got the, the tweeter bird and the truck and the server. That's, that's part number one, and that's going to be the server side stuff. Those three blocks are going to go together. We're going to talk about that. Then we'll move on to parsing the tweets and making notes. That's all going to happen in the Elm block. It's in the middle right there. That's part number two. Then we're going to move on to the JavaScript and Tone.js blocks together. That's part number three. Uh, that's for actually playing the sounds. And then we'll come back for a nice rounding out with the Elm block and the monitor block together as the visual playback. That's a little map of what we're going to go through. So part one, getting tweets to the browser. So we're going to be using Elixir on the back end, which is a pretty neat language. And there's been some pretty interesting integration work done between Elixir and Elm. Elixir's got some nice features that are scalable and, and have lots of really cool buzzwords and make us feel really good about our employment and stuff. So we're going to use that. And it's also got a really cool frame, web framework called Phoenix that has some neat features we'll be using. But uh, a disclaimer, I actually have no idea what I'm doing. So uh, I don't know how to write Elixir code. I only learned enough for the talk. So I'm not actually going to show you any code, <laughs> because it works, but it's probably horrible, OK? But I'll show you comments instead. So here, <laughs> thank you. So here we've got our module, our Twitter module. Now, this is something we wrote. There is a library in Elixir that talks to Twitter and gets tweets, but that's about all it does. So we need a way to consume those tweets. So what we're going to do here is we've got uh, the first part. You can see there it's called def reader. And that is a little worker that gets spawned by Elixir. It gets run in its own little space. And what it does is it perpetually, it, it starts up and never dies, it perpetually listens to tweets from Twitter. And it also acts like a queue. When it gets tweets in, it holds them in storage until they're requested. So you could also think of this as a generator. I mean, the way a generator in a language maybe like Python works. It'll yield a tweet when it's asked for one. Otherwise, it just queues them right up. And then we've got a listener right below it. So the listener, it runs also once. There's only one listener running when the app starts up. And it makes sure that a reader is running. And then the listener will ask the reader for a tweet. And it'll wait until the reader has a tweet. Once the reader has a tweet and it gives it back to the listener, then the listener says, all right, I'm going to handle this tweet. And I'm going to call myself in n milliseconds, in some number of milliseconds. So this listener calls itself recursively. It's basically like a game loop. It's just running forever, asking for more tweets. And once it gets a tweet, it calls the callback that's passed in there. See, it says listener callback. It calls that with the new tweet. So Phoenix, which is the web framework we're using, has this really cool concept called channels. Channels are a high-level API wrapper over WebSockets. They take care of a lot of the nasty stuff, a lot of the exponential back off, and a lot of the making sure the connection happens, and making all the, the low level stuff. It, it just smooths it all over and gives you a nice API. Plus, there's some really cool libraries for Elm that wrap it up. So on the server side here, you can see that this def start, that's the function that launches the server. And right in there, we've got twitter.listener, and then we pass in a callback to broadcast tweet. So right there, when the server starts, we're going to say, start listening to tweets from Twitter. When you get one, call this, this callback. And you can see right below, def broadcast tweet. Then we're going to call broadcast on our endpoint. And we're going to say, all right, send out a message into the, into the channel verse uh, that's a tweet with a tweet body. 
And so we're just going to send it out there and see what happens. And that'll get sent to, a browser, to all of the listening browsers. And this is what a tweet looks like once it gets dropped in. So this is our good old friend JSON. Tweets just got the author of the tweet, the picture of the author so that we can identify whose fault it is, and the text for the tweet um, so that we can go ahead and parse it. That, that was section one. We, we did it. Hey, server applause. <laughs> we just, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for humoring my request for applause. In, in about 10 minutes, we went through what took me like a month of work to do, so. I hope you appreciate how good you are at this. OK, so on to Elm. We need to know how to consume a Phoenix channel now in Elm. Well, there's this super, super neat little library uh, from F. Bonetti, which I don't know how to say. And I don't know if you're here. But if you are, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and you, can, you can use it too. So this library comes with a model to put on your model that keeps track of the stateful things that have to do with sockets, because there are stateful things. So it keeps track of that. It also comes with its own set of messages and commands and a subscription. So it's almost like its whole own little app. You put that on your model, you respond to its messages, and then you also, as you can see right here, I'm zoomed in right now on this code. This is where I'm knitting the socket model to put on. You can see that I've got uh, the WebSocket URL that I'm giving it. And then I'm also telling it what channel to join. And at the very last, you see receive tweet right there. That's my custom algebraic data type that says, when I get a tweet, when it comes in, I want you, lovely library, to wrap that tweet in this algebraic data type and call my update function with it, because it'll return a command subscription. So I get, essentially, all you need to know is that we magically now get messages when our server has new stuff for us and everything else is taken care of, which is so cool. OK, so now we need to take that tweet that we got from the server. We need to break it up into its notes, because right now we've just got a string. So here's a function called notes that takes in an int and a string and returns a list of notes. And we're done, because this is a declarative language, so it'll do all the back end stuff for us. Oh, we're not done. OK, um, so <laughs> I guess we'll have to actually write this function. We'll do that in a second. Um, so here's the note type. A note has a tweet ID. That's that int right there that you see. Notes, int, tweet ID. Um, and it's got a letter. That letter is going to represent what note we're playing. This is going to basically reflect the structure that we talked about earlier of the notation. Uh, accidental, octave, length. And then at the end, you'll see parse start and parse end. That's new. That comes from our actual parsing that we're going to talk about in a moment. That, those are the indices in the string of where our notes started and ended so that we can highlight it when we're playing back to the user. Let's do some TDD. I did some TDD while I was doing this, and it was pretty wonderful. Uh, this is a great, great case for doing some, some TDD because all you need are inputs and make sure that outputs happen. So we've gotten a straight statement here. We call that notes function with a fake tweet ID, which is 0 and a string which has just one note in it. That should be an A-sharp eighth note in the second octave. And we want to assert that it returns a note with the correct structure, just one note in an array. But uh, how, do we're, how are we going to get to that point? That's, that's the question. How do we get it done? So here's where we start to use partial combinators. And we feel really cool because we just said the word combinator. And that's, <laughs> that's all you're going to know about combinators. But there's a library from Bogdan P. And if you're here, thank you. Thank you for writing it. Called Elm Combine. And oh, hold on, I went too fast. I'm going to go back now. There we go. So all you need to know about parser combinators at this point is they're going to help us extract a piece of information from a string, keep track of where that information came from, and keep track of what we have left to do. So what it'll do is it'll allow us to say, design what kind of stuff we're looking for, and then it'll give us a process for holding a context alongside a string. That context says, you know, here's, here's how far you're along you are in parsing. So that's what it's going to do for us. And in order to use it, we're going to build a set of regexes that identify the tokens we're looking for. We're going to define the order of precedence that they come in. And then we're going to use the parser library to step through the string, keeping track of the context until we get out what we need and there's nothing else left to do. And then we're going to win. So, Here's some of the regexes. 
That top one is disgusting and wonderful all at the same time. You can see that we've matched a group right here. These are the notes, A through G. So that's how a note starts. Then we've got any characters, because we, can, we just want to take anything that's between that and the possible sharp or flat indicators. We want to just throw that away. So this note says, yep, you've got, you've got an A through G, and then you can have a plus or minus, and then you can have some of those letters we talked about for indicating length, and then the octave. So that's basically all that that says. And then we've got the not note regex, which is the inverse of that. It says, take anything, any character, as long as it's not uh, something that looks like a note. And then lastly, we have the hash or the mention, because we don't want to play hashes, hashtags, or mentions. And here's where we're going to start to put together our parser. So first thing we do, this is defining the order of precedence. First thing we're going to do is we're going to take that regex for the hash or the mentions, and we're going to look to see if the, if the part of the string we're parsing now, I, don't, I should have done a really cool graphic for this, but like imagine my arms are the string and my head is, no, that's not going to work out. Imagine, <laughs> imagine that we've got this big string to work with, and we're going to take as many characters as we can and match it with this parser. And then we're going to handle them, or we're going to throw them away, or we're going to just handle the rest. So that's how we're going to iterate through this string. We're like, does it match? Yes, take it out. Does it match? Yes, take it out. And that's what we're going to keep doing. And then if you run into a no, and it's like, does it match? No. It's like, give me a different parser matcher. And then it'll give it, and then it'll match it, and it'll take it out. And so that's what we're going to end up doing. So first thing we do is we check for hash or mention. It's like, does it have a hash or a mention? Yes, it does. So it takes it out. And you can say that it says, always empty quotation marks. That's because we're just going to return an an empty string if we have a, a hash, because we want to ignore it completely. And then we check to see if it matches a note. And if it does match a note, we're going to return that as a string. So we get a note, a string of note out. And then lastly, if it doesn't match a note, we're going to return that string too. And ultimately, we'll throw that away, because we want to just say, hey, anything else that's between notes, when you finish a note and before our next one starts, just get rid of it. And now here's a zoomed out view of doing the actual parsing. Um, you can see right there where it says combine map. If you zoom in, that's where we were looking before, the note stir parser. That's where we built our parser. Now, that's an object that represents the parsing we're going to be doing. Uh, and then right down below, OK, so what we do is we actually run that parser. You can see combine.parse, note stir parser, context.input. What we're saying is, based on the current context, go ahead and run the parser again. Give me a result and a new context. And then I'll be in charge of calling, keeping track of that context and calling myself again later. And that's how we're going to step through the string little by little. Now we've got this case that says, hey, we got back a result from the parsing. Now, if it's an error, we want to make a super robust parser. We don't want it to ever break. We don't want to say, hey, you formatted your tweet wrong. I'm not going to play your music. We're just going to be agreeable and pull out as many notes as we can. So if we run into a parsing error, we're just going to ignore it and pretend that nothing happened. And if we don't, if we get a string out, we're going to go ahead and call this function called from string, very aptly named and also non-informative, I'm sorry. It's a fr from string function. We're going to pass in the string and the tweet ID. And what that will do is it'll give us back uh, a maybe string. So we're going to end up with a, with a, after running this function, we end up with a maybe note, either a nothing or just note. And uh, so what we'll do is we'll call this function over and over again keeping track of the context, passing it along, giving it the parser, until we get a list of maybe, uh, maybe notes. Once we get a list of maybe notes and there's nothing left to parse, we're done parsing. And at that point, we're going to go through the list of maybe notes, we're going to throw away all the nothings, and we're going to take all the just notes and extract the note, and we'll end up with a list of notes. So that's it. I don't know if you ever knew that parsing is so easy, but that's just like, why do people take forever to write languages? I don't know. Evan, why is it taking so long? I don't understand. It's <laughs> done. OK. Now let's go play those sounds. In order to do that, I wasn't able to find a library yet that wraps up the Web Audio API for Elm. So instead of trying to do a lot of work, I did the lazy thing and decided to just go ahead and use ports. Just go ahead and, and use that native interop that's been provided for us. Here's what a port looks like going out. This on the top, you see port play takes a list of port notes. Now you're like, what's a port note? You haven't told us that. And I'm like, well, just be patient. I'll tell you in a minute. So you take a list of port notes, and you get back a command. 
uh, command message, just that's, that's normal, that's how ports work. And then on the JavaScript side, you can see we're tapping into the play port with the subscribe function, we're getting back some notes, a list of notes. And then for each of those notes, we're gonna tell our JavaScript player to go ahead and queue up that note. So it's that simple, that relationship there is very simple. And then on the other side, you can see here in JavaScript, app.ports.playing.send note. Once we're playing a note, we wanna notify Elm that that note is being played. So we make a port, we send back a port note through it, and this is what it looks like on the Elm side. You've got port playing, maybe port note to message. So that's saying, give me a, basically a message creator. So it's something that wraps up a port note, and produces a message, and uh, I'll give you a subscription. So that subscription will, subscription will call our update function whenever we've got a new note that's playing. And so then I was like, oh, okay, what's a port note? A port note is a serializable representation of note. You may not have noticed it earlier, but the note type uses a custom algebraic data type for accidental, for type safety, and also for, uh, this is a contrived example because I wanted to be able to show this to you too. So uh, accidental is of type maybe accidental, and that is not serializable by Elm because by default, it'll serialize the stuff that you can put into JSON. And it's like, I have no idea how to put that into JSON. So we need to go ahead and convert our custom algebraic data type to something that it can serialize, which is a string. So this is kind of border protection stuff. And we know that when we're gonna approach the borders of JS land, we want our object to be JS compatible. And then when we're coming back from JS land, we can, we can take care of getting it back into our nice algebraic data types. So that's the reason for port note. And now it's explained. Okay, so let's go into the library for playing stuff called Tone.js. Pretty cool, but it did take me forever to figure out the API. So uh, we're not gonna talk much about it because it's, complex, but all you need to know is we can create a synth and we can create a part. That part is going to play a note. You can see we've got a little callback here that says function cur time note. It's going to play a note. And then while we're playing that note, we're going to go ahead and call, you can see right there below, get next note. This is a small window into a, a bigger JavaScript player that queues up. It takes a queue of notes and it holds them there. So we're going to request the next note from that queue. And we're gonna say, after I'm done playing this note, play that next note. And then right down here, you can see where we're calling on play note. On play note is that function you saw earlier that calls back and sends a note through a port to Elm. That's all that does. It's a callback that says, yeah, go ahead and tell Elm that this note is being played. And you can see right there in the middle too, we're sending on play note null. That's how we tell it that nothing is playing. So we've got all the tools that we need. And that's all we're gonna do for the, the music playing part. Now, we need to be able to give the user some nice feedback, because it would be pretty boring to have a blank screen, even if we have cool music playing. So that's this part from the design. And uh, luckily, since we thought ahead, our context, I'm sorry, our parser extracted the context for the position of the notes as we were parsing. And so with that note that's being played, we've got the start index and the end index. So this is a zoom into the code that's rendering a tweet to the screen. And uh, it's gonna chunk that text from the tweet up into three parts. The part that comes before the highlight, the part that is the highlight, and it's gonna wrap that in a nice div. You can see, sorry, in a P, give it the class of playing, and then there's the text after the highlight. So that's how we're gonna handle rendering that stuff. Uh, but other than that, the render function is incredibly simple because all we have is a model that represents our playing state at any time. And whenever that playing state changes, we get, a, we get an event from JavaScript that bubbles through ports and that's gonna update the model which calls our update function, which then updates the model, which then calls the view function, which then you know the rest of it. It renders the view. Um, even though it's like playing with fire, yep, yep. But here's the thing, like I was pretty excited about this until I saw Jessica's talk and then I was like, I am weak. I'm not even gonna live code anything, so I hope nobody's impressed because there's no room left for being impressed after Jessica's talk. Okay, um, so pull out your phones or your laptops. I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to try to compose a masterpiece. Um, hopefully everyone's internet works, I think it will. And don't send a tweet yet, okay? 
because I have to open up the browser first because it's only going to play in real time what's happening live. So everybody hold your tweets, but please pull out your phone and use the hashtag ElmConf. Try to compose something. Why do, don't try. Do or do not compose something that is beautiful and, and we'll hear it. And uh, if we, we can also play you know, some, some music in the mid-time. I don't know if, if anyone wants to listen to music. But otherwise, I could just tell some dad jokes. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah? Somebody said, yeah, you want to hear dad jokes? The, the problem is my two-year-old doesn't understand English completely yet. So I don't actually have to have any dad jokes. I can just tell her anything I want. And she doesn't laugh anyway. So <laughs> 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 but if anyone has a good dad joke, you're welcome to yell it out. OK, I'll tell the programmer joke. I'm sure you've all heard this one. Have you heard this one? Or am I just distracting you from composing your tweets? You should finish composing your tweets, then listen to the joke. Here's the joke. Hope you're done. Here's the joke. So uh, let me tell you a joke. So here's the joke. <laughs> the, the programmer, no, I started on the wrong note. So there's a guy. He's a programmer, OK? This guy's a programmer, and his wife says, go to the store and uh, and give me some uh, two loaves of bread. And if they have milk, or no, if they have eggs, uh, bring me 12. And he's like, OK, that makes total sense. So he goes to the store. And they do have eggs. And he arrives home with 12 loaves of bread. And his wife is like, and he's like, that's exactly what you said, isn't it? <laughs> OK, you got it, right? <laughs> it, it took a second. If you didn't get it, talk to me afterward. OK, I hope you all are ready. Here's the scary part. HTTP colon slash slash nightingale dot dot space. Now, I always, oh, it's already working. Beautiful job, Alex. Oh, it's not showing? No, oh, there it is. I'm sorry. Thank you. Zoom in. <laughs> that is beautiful. Look at those. It's appropriate to clap now if you want. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Where to go? I like the dramatic use of silence. If you feel like dancing, you can stand up and dance. This is OK. How many does it say we have left to go through? 13? <laughs> I, I don't even know if we have enough time. It's amazing. You guys are great. Oh no, our tweet. <laughs> Sorry, the parser failed. Bugs. Somebody filed a bug report. Sounds like something I know. <gasps> yeah! <laughs> Incredible. That is certainly a bug. <laughs> hey, but there are no runtime exceptions, am I right? <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> that, 
That was amazing, Luke. Wow. It's dangerous to go alone. Take this. made all of your followers unfollow you. I hope, I hope you're happy. <laughs> Thank you. That was way better than I thought it would be. All right, so that's the end. My name is Murphy, and uh, I would really love it if you'd be my friend, because I love making friends. So please, if you are at all interested in talking to me, come up, talk to me at the conference, or I'm on Twitter. I'm also on the Elm Slack. I'm also on like 50 other Slacks, as I'm sure everybody is. Um, there's some credits there, too. Thank you to all of those resources and people. Now, last but not least, I co-host a meetup called JS Alt, and we have a meeting in October, and this meetup is for everybody. It's not just for people in the beautiful, blessed state of Utah, where I am from. Anyone else from Utah? <laughs> <laughs> I am. OK, great. Well, those two and I might be at the meetup next month if you want to come. But if you are interested, it's also going to be online all, all the month. So this is a meetup that is for any language that compiles down to JavaScript. And I'm sure Elm will be an essential part of that. So come join us. Come be part of our, our friendship. And thank you again so much for listening today. I really appreciate it. <laughs>